Jared Poland froknowsphoto.com and I'm really excited to bring you this special flying solo edition. We're calling this the Fronos Photo Guide to DSLR Video Flying Solo where I put out the word to you guys that Todd and I are going to sit here and answer your flying solo questions about either the video guide itself or the guide to DSLR video or just questions that you have about making video with your DSLR. Obviously, it's a big subject, so big that we made that guide that is released and uh, took a long time to make. But anyway, before we do that, if you guys don't know who Todd is, this is Todd Wolf, who is my counterpart all throughout this guide. Todd, how are you? Good. We are counterparts. I, I guess if we had to stare at each other for eight straight days of shooting, oh. though it wasn't eight straight days. No. Because we did, there was that snowstorm. Four and four. Dude. Four and four. Could you imagine? We really crushed it, though. It, it, it was it was over like twenty five hours of footage. It was unbelievable. It, honestly, it was daunting when I sat down to edit this guide because it was so much stuff, so much information, and it's one of those things that if anybody that shoots a major project, you always sit down and second guess yourself. And I was like, oh my. God gosh, how am I ever going to tackle this? And to be out on the other side now and see how it's all fallen together is so rewarding and at the same time so exciting because I can't wait for people to get their hands on this. Yeah, no, and, and if you already have your hands on it, because who knows when they're going to watch this. True. You never know because uh, this thing's going to live on. But, you know, the point of making this video is to answer as many questions as we can. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are not trying to hide anything. We just want to share as much information as possible so that if you do like the things that we talk about or the way that we answer it, or you find that DSLR video is something for you, that you go ahead and you pick up the guide, which you can click up on the screen, and it will take you over to a preview, which is going to give you more of a preview than you're going to see here. But I will tell you, Todd is probably going to be cutting in uh, some actual footage from the guide at some point during... What? Don't don't give me that. Here and there. You're we'll cutting see. in. We'll I want see. people to see stuff. We'll see. We'll but see. also, if you want a preview of the guide, you can watch the trailer over on the site and um, decide for yourself. But mm -hmm. we've got. A, let me give you some background on Todd before we jump into some questions here. I will tell you that Todd shot the very first <laughs> video guide, the the Fronos Photo Guide to Getting Out of Auto. I did. Todd pretty much did that thing as a one man band, meaning he did everything on that shoot from from doing motion sliders to doing the shooting the shooting the uh, setting up the lighting shooting the video the only thing he didn't do is audio yeah i'm a big stickler on audio especially i mean we we stress it a lot in the guide but it's so important to me that i just don't trust myself to monitor the whole time it's very possible to do it but uh you know i had a little had a little leeway so we had had an audio guy but yeah no that was very much a nearly one-man band scenario. Yeah, and we, we hit on the one-man band thing a lot because we want to get across the point that you can do this all on your own. The fact that you can learn how to use your DSLR, learn how to do mo add motion, learn how to get your lighting proper. I mean, if you're already a photographer, you do understand lighting, so you mm -hmm. do have a leg up. Uh, that stuff is extremely important. Um, the audio is definitely something that we... Look, all I will Huge. tell you... All I will tell you guys out there is that I wish I had a guide like this when I tried to figure out how to shoot video the fr when I started to learn video because I had to I freaking had to teach myself. Look, when we discussed doing this guide, I literally sat down and thought about all of the super important things that I've learned over the years by trial and error and through um much more knowledgeable people that I've met along the way, and and that's what we've dumped into this guide. And, and I'm, I'm, I wish I would have had something like this when I got my hands on my first DSLR, or even before my first DSLR. I, I was I was doing some video stuff pre DSLR, and there's so many things that translate beyond DSL, just the DSLR video in this guide that I think is so valuable and can give people such a great foundation to. Uh, run off and do their videos. Yeah, basically, before we jump into these questions, because these questions are going to trigger a lot of stuff because they are 
really, really good. Yeah. I'm sure people are sitting there going, well, who, who is it for? Who are you guys? Who did you make this for? And honestly, we made it for ourselves, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. We took the information that we wanted to know when we started, and we built it off of that. So you have your fundamentals. I mean, I have a table of contents. You guys can see the table of contents online. Just things like... the. Look, we cover basics for anybody that's picking it up for the first time, but all I will tell you is if you're a photographer already, the exposure triangle acts differently in video than it does for stills. Yeah. And it just does because shutter speed plays a different effect. It's not like, oh, I need more light. I'm going to slow my shutter speed down or oh, I have too much light. I'm going to I'm going to bump my shutter speed really high. I used to do that in my backyard. I would be shooting at like what? two thousandth of a second and the butterfly in the back would look all staccato and, and it's not saying that that's wrong no there's times to do that but generally, it's a look it's a look right and generally speaking one of the rule one of the uh, the basics that we do talk mm-hmm. about is that you uh your frame rate we talk about frame rate heavily yes you know whether you're at 24 frames uh what's it 24 30 60. 30 60 and deciding on what your shutter speed should be and one of the first things one of the most important things is understanding that if your frame rate is 24 frames per second you in essence want to double that yep. to get your shutter speed which yep. means the closest thing would be 1 50th, 150th of a second yep. and that is just there, there's reason do you have a, a quick reason i know we explained it in the guide it, it retains that motion blur that uh, you're used to seeing in, in, in most of the movies you've grown up watching. The cinematic effect. The cinematic look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, I'm talking a lot. I got a lot of notes here. The one-man band. The ge- Oh, <laughs> we'll talk about the gear myth part. Because a lot of people are like, well, do I need to have... What? Why are you shaking your head? No, you're absolutely right. No, no I'm absolutely, you're absolutely right. absolutely right. And all, all, what, what I can tell you is that the very first guide that Todd shot, he used the Canon 60D. I did. And I kind of yelled at him a lot. I'm like, why are you doing this? Where's my full frame camera? And in the end, it didn't matter. Oh, and on top of that, he had an 18 to 135 kit lens that he used when we were running and gunning. It was awesome. And it turned out to be really darn good. So, you know, the gear myth means it it doesn't matter what you shoot with if you understand the fundamentals. Yes. Anything you want to add or should I just jump into like questions? I'm really curious to see what the questions are. So let's get right into it. I think I think everything's going to come out from the questions. I do, too. This is, guys, think of this as, like, remember when I used to do the spree casts, if you've been around for the first two guides I put out, I would release it and then do these live spree casts? This is basically that, just with better questions, because you got to submit them, and we can pick and choose the good ones from the bad ones. Mm-hmm. Not really, well, there are, yeah, there's always bad questions. Yeah, there's ones the that go one. way over the top, that they're like, tell me exactly how I should set my camera for this situation. And it's not really something that, can, that you can do. And now, mm-hmm. before I ask this question, Todd... Just just the one other thing. We do real world shooting throughout this video guide. Yes. We go to the bowling alley. Mm-hmm. We do a narrative narrative shoot where mm-hmm. we have two actors. We have an actor and an actress, Maria, yep. for yep. anybody that remembers Maria. Yep. That they that you wrote a script. Yep. Just to show that we can do action. We can do an EPK. We can do the yeah, we learn how to direct and all the, all right, I'm shutting up. Yeah. Clark Podger. Clark Podger. Yeah. All right. What's Clark gotta say? Are there any pre-assumptions or basic skill sets you require before using the guide? Or does it start with the basics? So I'll start because I like to start. Honestly, there are no prerequisites. Who it's for. If you're a person that just picked up your first DSLR and you really aren't sure what in the world you're doing when it comes to video, this is going to help you out. This guide is going to give you the fundamentals that you need to learn to go ahead and shoot video. If you're a, a hobbyist, somebody that's been shooting photos for a while, I, I'm just talking. I'm talking. I'll, I'll throw it to you at some point. No, you're absolutely right. Keep, continue. It, if you're a hobbyist or a beginner that has photo skills because you've been taking photos, you're going to definitely have a leg up on understanding the concepts and stuff that we do because we don't get extremely, like, we don't go as basic as I did with the fundamentals guide, the, the photos photo guide to getting out of auto because that's not really necessary here. But even if you haven't picked up that guide, you still are going to understand how to use your camera after watching this and then the last one that i say because it's for hobbyists and and amateurs especially if you have a little bit of video knowledge like when i had a little bit of video knowledge i could have used this stuff in here to to really get me there quicker fine tune it instead of taking me four or five years to figure out what i was doing this would have done it and by the way this is roughly a six hour long guide which is packed full of over six hours is it over six hours six hours i know that's that's like that's like uh the the lord of the rings Rings. and the hobbit compared uh, all in one almost Almost. Almost. Just the tip. 
Yes. Anyway, so let me get back to that. Yes. It is, it's, it is intense. It is long, and it, it isn't boring. I will massive. tell you that. No, much. it's massive, and it's entertaining. We do keep it entertaining. It moves at a good clip. It's not a straight six hours of, of, of one thing. It, it's it's very, uh, very entertaining. It moves things accordingly in, in, a, in, a, in, in a way that what we talk about first, we build upon that, and we sure. build upon that, and we build upon that. And I don't want to get too far ahead, but... What amazed me is once everything was sort of edited and I started putting it all together sequentially for the final assemble, I was really amazed at how much information was laid out in the guide. And I was like, oh, if I would have had this five years ago, ten years ago, I could have saved myself so many mistakes, so much trouble. And I, and I, we both went into this again with the, with the intention of trying to uh, prevent the mistakes that we made for other people. Sure. And the, and the, the last person, because it's asking uh, pre-assumptions on basic skills, even if you're a professional photographer, somebody that has been shooting for 20, 30 years, yeah. even 10 years, five years, it doesn't matter. If you're just a quote-unquote photographer, but you see that switch on the back of the camera and want to get into video because you've got people knocking on your door saying, hey, can you also shoot video after you do those headshots yeah. can you make me an epk yep. not only is it an opportunity to make more money if that's what you're looking for but you already have a leg up because you understand photography and that is going to help you tra i still think photographers have an easier time going to video than videographers have going to photo if you're a successful photographer you already have an eye so you're already capturing good images and you're, you're good composition and whatnot so i think i think just making the transition and getting all the technicalities and the fundamentals down on video is probably a, an easier transition bram tolkien bram 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 oh you sound just like a uh, maybach music all mm -hmm. right i've tried shooting i've tried shooting video with my dslr i used the lens in autofocus mode as a result i had the humming sound of the motor drives in my recording how do you keep a moving subject in focus? Well, I get. Are these two questions? There are there are two answers to that question. All right. As mm -hmm. a result, I had the humming sound of the motor drives mm -hmm. in my recording. Mm -hmm. there, How do you keep a moving subject in focus in manual mode? So there's two questions. Take the first audio thing. There's even thing. three there. So the fact that he was in auto fo of focus is just no no because again we get into this in the guide is that focus is a storytelling. Uh, tool that you use to kind of tell all the audience what's important. If I focus on a, a, a cup in the foreground and then over to the uh, the subject, you know, you're telling people what's important there. You need to control focus manually. The humming sound, you're already telling me that you're using the in-camera audio, which you should not be using because that is should only be used for reference. Yeah. So right there, you're telling me you're using in-camera. That probably isn't the best way to to get audio for a good video. So if you get your audio off camera, even if it's your lens making the noise, because maybe your image stabilization is making noise in the lens or it's your, your autofocus. Well, it's just the focus motors that you're that it's picking it up. Yeah, it, it's not going to pick up anything because your audio is off camera at that point and you'll you'll solve that immediately. Do we have a can, can we can we run a clip? Do we have a clip for that? For which part? Which uh, the audio part. Uh yeah off camera we, we, audio. we can show them a little bit of uh, audio. Yeah, can we? I guess. We'll oh. show them a little bit. All right, here's just a little bit. All right, Todd, we've got a lot of audio things set up on the table because audio is one of those things that a lot of people may forget about when it comes to video. Well, we certainly don't forget about it because it is just as important, if not more important, than the video itself. Sometimes you can get away with not so good looking video, but if the audio is terrible, well then nobody's gonna listen to it or even watch it. So we wanna go over some of the different options that we have here that we personally use and you guys can use out there. So Todd, what do you wanna start with? Well, the first thing we have is the actual on-camera microphone. Now that's not really the best source to use and you wanna avoid it at all costs. The only time you would really use it is as a reference track if you're having other audio sources recorded. Sure, so when I first started out, this is what it sounded like with my YouTube videos. What you're hearing now is coming from the camera and I talk loud. I project. It sounds like you're in a in a bathroom sometimes because that's just what that thing sounds like. When I was making those videos in my backyard, I was picking up the birds chirping, the cars going by, the wind blowing. 
and it just wasn't the best. It wasn't always clear. So that's one of the options that we highly recommend staying away from or just use it as a reference track. So other than the built-in audio, what else is important here? So there was just a little bit. Just a tip. Was it good, Todd? I think it's good. <laughs> I, I know. It was It was definitely a little good. I mean, because audio is so important. So that question is, what we stress more than anything is not using the in-camera audio uh, to record it, the in-camera mm -hmm. microphones. Now, we also we go into things from the most inexpensive, inexpensive way to recording audio. Yep. I know that you had a really inexpensive lavalier mic that was wired. The wired one, yeah. How yeah. much was like, 30 like 30 bucks? 30 bucks, yeah. So that's inexpensive. We've great. got the Smart Lab from Rode that's like $69, and we go all the way up to using more expensive options, but just showing you that we make sure that we give you all of the options to decide for yourself what you can afford, but also show you that if you only have 30 bucks to spend on audio, buy this lavalier because quality audio, it, you could have the greatest looking video in the world, but if your audio doesn't sound good, people aren't going to listen. They're not going to pay attention. So your audio is awesome, is That's extremely huge. important. That's huge. Um, how do you keep a moving subject in focus in manual mode? Uh, now we're talking about focusing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's going to, there's going to be a couple different things there. I would say aperture is going to play a huge part. That if you know you've got a crazy uh, moving subject that it's going to uh, be hard to keep in focus. For example, my finger p playing the piano. Exactly, which we go into detail there. Can we show a clip of that, Todd, I, when I'm we're done talking? I'm probably showing a clip as we speak. Okay, good. So so you'll be able to see a little bit of that. Um, but then to stabilize Can I interrupt it, you? Well, you always do. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. I know. Think of this. Because yeah. I'm just... I'm remind Are you all right, Stephen? You good? You're looking to be all weird. Uh, he doesn't have a microphone, so this he can't is, talk. Um no, see, this goes into that whole idea that we go into pre-production. We talk about uh, how are we going to do a, a photo, a, a video shoot? How are we going to make everything work? This is more of a flying solo type thing. So we don't exactly, we, we had a pre-production of we've got notes, we've got things that we're going to work on. We hammer that home heavily in the guide as well. Yeah. Uh, pre-production and the importance of preparing. That's but, huge. Go ahead. That's huge. Um, so... Beyond that, I guess the stabilization was the second part of that question. Well, was the you you were talking about aperture playing a part in uh, and trying you, to keep things in focus. Yeah. And then I would also say, you know, if you're trying to pull focus on your lens, that's not going to be good either because you're shaking your camera around. So we get into follow focuses and devices to 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 uh, pull focus better. Uh, oh, yeah, they, when we, you're running and gunning. I know there was like a $6 option that Steven pulled out of his bag yep. that just zip ties to yep. it. So you can see that thing moving. We've got your follow focus, which is a little bit more expensive. Yeah, it's just a standard follow focus with a focus ring on the lens. And it's uh, it's pretty pretty standard with what people use. And they're, they're at all price points. I mean, sure. they're very... Uh, it's it's not a difficult thing to get a hold of. So here's, here's my tips for... Shooting in manual. The, now, I will say that there are cameras today, like Canon makes a 70D. The Canon 70D has the STM motors in some of the lenses that allow you to touch the screen oh, yeah. and move the focus. Now, yes, that's autofocus, but you are controlling where it's going to focus. If you have control over it and the camera isn't going to shift, then by all means, use it. Now, I've used that to shoot a concert, and it was fantastic for, for changing focus. I could focus on a, a guy's guitar pick on his amp and then focus on a guitar pick on the other side of the amp or focus on the guitar yep. player. Yep. So if, the, if you have that auto option right there, I definitely suggest trying that one out. It's still a manual input. Yes. Like, you're still telling the camera what's important to your story. And yep. we, we, we talk about this so much in the guide about what is what what all these things that we utilize to push your story forward and how huge that is and and again i think those cameras are very interesting the only thing i, I was concerned about is um stability is a huge thing that we talk about and poking around at your camera could cause some stability issues but I, I well think and also if you're practice. if you're hand holding it it's going to be hard as it's up near your face to try to touch the screen, yeah. especially when yes. we touch on the uh, the the monitors using external monitors and stuff like that. Yep. So, all right, let's move on. Dot org. Sam Hamber. Sam. 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 When editing the video, how many times did you stop and think, "Damn, that's some great info to share." Well, I think I kind of touched on that, especially uh, especially when it all came together at the end and we're doing the final assemble. I was very proud of what we put together because it, it, it's so much information in a very uh, casual way 
that we put it forward. I don't think it's overly uh, technical. I think it's just enough to get people started, give them a great foundation, and make everybody a little bit dangerous out there. All right. Gunner Langland, how big of a crew do you need for an average to good looking video? Average to good? Well, <laughs> can I take it? Yeah, I guess. I'll, I'll take this. Look, one man band. Yep. My first YouTube videos for the first almost three and a half or so years, I sat there and shot every one of the YouTube videos myself. I had to set up a tripod. I had to pre-focus on the chair that I would be sitting in. I had to make sure my audio was... Actually, I almost said I had to make sure my audio was good. I had to make sure the audio was good for what I thought audio was supposed to be, right. only to find out later on that I was getting a lot of hissing noise, and nobody sat me down and said, Jared, you need to change your attenuation, or you need to change your levels down because you're peaking, and I didn't know what the hell I was talking... I didn't know what I was doing. So I made all of those mistakes, and we incorporated those mistakes into the guide to figure out how to actually do it right, so we do that. The answer to this question is you need just yourself. Yep. Because if you can do it on your own, which is what we show you guys, if you can do this on your own, you can start adding pieces to the puzzle later on because you become the educator. If you want to bring on an assistant and say you have five tasks to take and you just want to give one of give them one, well, then you go, all right, here's your task. You need to do X, Y, and Z. You are teaching them because you now know how to do every piece of of the the equation you're absolutely right and i think um also when you do expand you'll be knowledgeable enough to have educated conversations with folks that are that may be a little bit more knowledgeable in each of these departments sound lighting but you'll have a great foundation to be able to have a good conversation and give a little bit of direction on where you want your lights how you want your sound to be yeah i think it's a great foundation and being that one man band has 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 served me very well over the years to be able to know when something is right or wrong that somebody else might be doing has been so valuable to me and just the simple fact that hey you know nowadays i do hire crews to do stuff but if i do need to go shoot something i can do it i can set up my lights i can set up my sound i can do it it's not a big deal anybody can do it i am by no means a, 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 a brilliant man by any stretch of the imagination. It was hard for me to learn the rights and the wrongs. And I think we cut that learning curve down with all this to make sure that you can do this on your own. When also, when you talk about learning curve, it's like you could go to a college, yeah. you could take a course, you could spend a couple thousand dollars to 20, 30, 40. I, look, our guy, this thing is $97 on sale. <laughs> It's like you now have left forty nine thousand uh, nine hundred and three dollars to go spend on some gear and to go shoot something on your own. The the point is, not only do we cut down the the, the time of learning to the six hours because you're going to learn a shit ton, but we're not just going to give you every. We, we give you a lot, but you have to learn from and, and take what we teach you and go out and shoot it. Yes. So the, the point is that you could go to school and learn there. You could search the internet for free videos because there are a lot of free videos. I've made free videos. They're very good. There's a lot of good ones out there. There are. But when, you're, when you want to find everything in one easily consumable piece of content, that's what we created here. And I think your time is worth money. So if you spend hours upon hours of searching for stuff, you're basically giving money away. And if you can get the fundamentals down from a $97 guide and then take that $30,000, $40,000 and go make your first feature film. Well, not that most people are going to be sitting there with thirty to 40000 Or whatever, or just invest any money that you might have put towards school into a project. I think that is a much better learning experience for people than uh, than than anything else. There's nothing there's nothing like learning on set and actually doing it. Well, that's true with anything. And that's why in the in that's why we go on location. And yes. you see, the, the, what I, when Todd was showing me, so look, Todd takes this stuff home and he edits it, and I then call him and go, Todd, where's my edit? I want to see something. But Todd's busy working on it, and I have to leave him alone. So this guide, I left him alone. I left him alone for a couple months because kind it of. took eight months. I, I left you alone. Kind of. You know I left All you right. alone. Okay. Uh, I forget what I was going to say. No, no, no. What was I going to say? Uh, oh, when I finally saw some of the shoots, I was like, holy crap. 
we are seeing what Todd is shooting through his camera. Mm -hmm. So we're watching him follow the the subject with a glide cam. We're 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 seeing the recording that he got, whether it's in focus, out of focus, because yep. we make mistakes throughout the thing. But Absolutely, that, that's the point yep. is that you're seeing it as it's happening. So you're learning. You're not just seeing like a lot of people will just show you the final results, yeah, and not give let you in to be like, oh, I can't tell you the secrets of how we created that. Well, you're going to see every piece of the puzzle that went into building the fun. So for for example, the narrative shoot. Not only yeah. do you see all the sliders being done, you see all the audio being set up, the lights being moved, the gliders talking about why we do that, but you'll see the final piece as it comes together. I I love the fact that cuz there like you said, you can find a lot of stuff online where you can you can find, you know, what how do you set your aperture? How do I sh set my shutter speed? But we build on top of that and put that into practice out in the field doing these shoots and it was so gratifying like i said when i put it all together and i was like oh my gosh this really makes sense when we reference things we mentioned previously when we're setting up a camera shot or when i'm giving direction to talent or when we're uh, um, moving lights or setting up sound it all makes sense at the end of the day because we set a great foundation through the educational portion of the of the of the dv of the the project and once we get out into the field it's 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 so fulfilling to me to see all those things come together. And I think people are going to have an aha moment. Like I can do that. Yeah. I can absolutely do exactly what they're doing because there's, there's no magic and you're going to see there's no magic. Cause we make plenty of mistakes and we're like, ah, now nah, I miss focus on that. Do it again. Which leads into the next question. Clark Podger, what level of fro humor can we expect? There's plenty of fro humor. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we had some fun. Well, I don't, I don't know if it was uh, because of uh, late nights or uh, or what was the case. Early but mornings, early late mornings, nights. but we had fun. There's we some had fun. Fun on the sofa. There's some fun in the in the uh, elevator. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, look. No matter what section it is, there's always a little bit of fun in it. Oh, well, it's the nature of you and everything you do. There's no way I was gonna be able to clamp that down. So no. it, it's all fun. I mean, we. But it's fun. But it's fun learning. Like it's, the it's hungry, fun learning. Yeah. Hungry, hungry hippos. Oh yeah. We've yeah, got yeah. a hungry, hungry hippos game. For Which what? We got hungry, hungry hippos to demonstrate uh, frame rate. You just wanted to play hungry, hungry hippos. I did, and I ate the yellow ball, and I ate ate, ate more balls than you. You did. I did. You did. I, you I, did. I, I, I'd like to. But at the same time, going going along with the fun aspect of it, it's 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 very um, approachable in the way that I think we discuss a lot of these techniques and a lot of these fundamentals in a way that everybody can absorb easily. Like I don't think we're ever talking over everybody in this guide. So let me uh, let me move forward here. Michael Credo. Michael. Michael. What do the different FPSs, frames per second, 24, 30, 60, do to video? Does it help with quality? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. It definitely helps with quality, and it depends what quality you want. So give me, where do you use 24 frames a second? What does it look like? 24 frames per second is what you see in the movie theater for the most part. 24 Unless you're Peter Jackson trying to shoot 48. 48 or, or, or whatnot. Yeah, now 30 frames per second is your video camera. Uh, iPhone shoot at 30 frames and, and you know a lot of the older video cameras they shoot 30 frames and that gave you the more realistic it looked like a camp camcorder like, a, a lot of sports are shot in 30 and 60 for that matter like the Super Bowl shot at 60 I mean it, it looks way more realistic but when you're trying to shoot maybe a music video or something like a film that has a film look that 30 frames is going to look not right to right. people it's just going to look like it's reality when it it, when we're exactly. used to seeing the 24 frames a exactly. second, which is, that means literally it's 24 still, in, in essence, it's like 24 separate images building up to get that uh, frame rate. Yep. And also, when you get to 60, the faster the frame rates that you use, the uh, the easier it is to do slower motion, to yep. slow it down later. But as we learn, as we teach, if you're going to shoot at 60 frames a second, that's 60 frames smushed into one second. That's a lot of extra data yep. that's going to fill your memory cards. It's two and a half times 24 frames. So when you do slow that down, it has a butter smooth slow motion. Whereas, you know, if you take that 24 and you try to slow it down, your editing software will actually duplicate frames. And that's when you get that 
the, not cool look in slow motion. Right. So when, when with part of the question here, and does it help with quality? So yes, knowing Absolutely. what you're going to shoot and having the proper frame rate set is going to either give you the right quality or the wrong. Because like Todd just said, if you want to slow down 24 frames a second into slow motion, it's going to look jittery, herky jerky, and not going to be right. But if you want to shoot uh, 60 frames a second to get slow motion, you're going to see how much smoother and better it is, thus giving you the better quality. Absolutely. Greg... Gr uh oh, G R Z E G O R Z. Grizzgor. Grizzgor's Rubik. Recording video HD. When, 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 okay, when recording HD video, SDHC or compact flashcards? I think that's a personal preference. I know you like the uh, CF cards. Uh, SD cards are obviously a little cheaper for for uh, for. Folks, um, I've always leaned towards the SD cards. I've never had I've never had a huge problem with them. Well, um, let me let me inter let me just interject. It's not even interrupting. Interject. Our entire means. process, all twenty five hours of footage, was shot on SD cards. Yes, they were absolutely. We, we filmed, so our crew was using five D Mark threes. Yep. To shoot us. Mm -hmm. Now that camera gives you a CF card and SD cards. Todd has a whole kit of SD cards that are lettered or, or numbered or both both so you have two sets one's numbered and one's, one's numbered lettered. and one's lettered because so if you've got two cameras one can use the letters and one can use the numbers so the rule of thumb here is if you are using these newer cameras that do 60 frames a second uh and at 1080, 1080 exactly right because we go into 1080 we go into all of the different frame rates mm -hmm. um uh, and what what frame rate, uh, resolutions yep we talk about all of that you want to make sure that you're using professional cards. Yes. I don't care how much they cost. Do not cheap out or skimp out on the memory card. You could you could have the best camera in the world, and then you can lose all of the information from it if the card goes bad. So you lost the whole day of shooting, yep. all of your crew, everything. So you want to try to have try to use the better cards and the faster. The better cards are going to uh, transfer more uh, megabytes per second, mm -hmm. which we discovered. Yep. In, we, Especially in low light situations. In low light situations, a bunch more data goes on those cards. And I think we had cards that were 30 megabytes per second. And, and they, were, they were stopping, and we had to make sure we had the 45s in the low light situations. Well, in the low light situations at 60 frames a second, we had one issue where one of the older cards that you had, because yeah. it was like yeah. letter J. So yeah. we were already yeah. down, yeah. and we just had to go dump some extra cards. But we got to that card, and we, could, we were trying to figure out why was the camera stopping. Yep. And then we sat there, and I looked at the card, and I'm like... Well, because it's an Ultra, an SD, a SanDisk Ultra 2 card. Exactly. Like, well, that's not fast enough to yep. keep up with this, and that's even in the 60D. Yep. So that, you know, you learn as you go. But It's, but it's definitely that's one something of those to things. keep in mind because you don't want to be shooting something important. You're getting a great performance. You're getting a great uh, 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 interview with a client, and all of a sudden your card stops, and you're sitting on your hands like, do I tell the client... Um, that uh, uh, that my car just stopped, or should I? Um, uh, I you don't want that. Just no, just well, just save <laughs> yourself that that agony. Well, the other thing now that you mentioned clients is you are like a producer. When you are dealing with a client, you have to be a director. You have to ask them the questions. Yep. You are in charge there. So if something does happen, you need to either you need to own it, own it. Just first flat out own it. Absolutely. But then be like, you know what? I liked what you did there. We're going we're gonna to do it one more time. I want to get it either from another angle. I mean, you're fudging it a little bit when you sure. tell them this, but you just be like, yeah, that was great take. Loved what you did there. Let me make one change. I got to change batteries or I got to do something. Or my like, One of those things you can get away with is saying yes. that the battery is uh, got to change batteries. Sure, but at the same time, if you can uh, avoid that by sure. getting a proper card and getting a proper battery... All the better, because regardless, <laughs> you're well, gonna you're gonna have the right batteries and the right cards, and still something's going to not go perfectly. Sure. There's enough things you're gonna have to fix. Well, speaking of batteries, one of those just the tips that pops up during the get. Can we run the tip that I have about? Um, did I do about leaving the LCD on? Oh, it's in there. I, I think so. Yeah. Can we just run it? All right, go ahead. Jared here with another tip. When you're not recording, be sure to turn off live view. It's gonna save the juice of your batteries. So the reason I wanted to show you guys the LCD just the tip, which we do, how many, do you remember how many tips there are? 
They're 20 something? About 18. 18 about, tips? I think about 18. So these are just fun little quick tips that we throw in there. But the reason I say the LCD thing is on the set, we had a couple of guys that love to just leave the LCD on. I do it myself. I, I don't. I'm of the school that if I'm not shooting, I save the battery power because I don't want my batteries going bad during a take. Because I'll be doing a take. And I'll hear one of the guys' uh, cameras click. I'll hear the the mirror drop, and then I'll be and then I'll get upset on set. Like why? And I, Todd's probably rolling me upset without sound. <laughs> well, you know, but you know what happened? I mean, when it, it did happen once or twice, you. I mean, you always had like we always had two other cameras rolling, and usually they would just let you finish your sentence, and then we would then we would pick back up, <laughs> which is a good tip as well for anybody shooting as the one-man band. If you do have a battery that dies in the middle of somebody's answer, be like, oh, that was great. Yeah, like you said, just do it one more time with feeling. No, knowing, with knowing, feeling. Knowing with darn feeling, well you just missed that, that question. Uh, one other thing, instead of saying with feeling, because that would probably upset me, being like, what, I didn't give you enough feeling? You know, I would probably say something like, do it with heart. No, we're going to try that um, with a different angle. You know, like we're going to move in a little tighter. I like that. I really like what you did. Can we do it again? I think I think that was great. I'd love to hear you hit this topic again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, being able to uh, work politically correct <laughs> with your client yeah. to make sure. Because I'm, I'm telling you, no matter what you plan for, and pre-production's huge, something's going to go wrong. And we, you know, we don't dive too deep into this about Let's, making mistakes, but I think, I think, be, you know, being confident enough and knowing that you've done proper pre-production, so all the little things don't happen, that you can, uh, when when minor things do come up, <sighs> bless you, Excuse when minor me. things do come up <laughs> in the course of the shoot, that you can you can uh, uh, dance around them uh, professionally. So what I was talking about was the LCD. I like to turn it off so we're not killing battery. Oh, right, right. Uh, right. But no, that's okay, because I was going to talk about pre-production, but there's probably questions coming yeah, up yeah, yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah, we're going to skip ahead. Julian ahead. Pop, P-O-P-P. Pop, pop, pop. Bang, bang, pop, pop. Oh, eh, oh, eh. How do you prepare for a how-to or comparison video? Do you have a script? <laughs> Pre-production. How do you plan cuts and shots and and still keep shooting in flow, including a preparation section would be great. So basically, I think what the preparation section she's asking for, or, or he, is basically talking about pre-production, uh, scripts, and uh, storyboarding. Yeah, yeah, let's tackle... There was a couple questions there. So yeah, let's tackle pre-production. And, I mean, we dedicate an entire section to pre-production. Go back to the first video guide. How much pre-production was in my very first Fronos Photo Guide to getting out of auto? I think we just auto. showed up at the park with a camera and microphone. Like, yeah, what do you want to shoot, I Jared? I had two pages yeah. that I thought was pre-production, and oh, I failed. You absolutely thought that Talk was. Talk about the flash guide real quick. How much pre-production in that one? I had bullet points. You had better. I had, had more bullet, bullet points. points. I had some bullet points there. So then when I tell Todd that we're going to make this guide together... Um, he came over and we spent five or six days pre-production going over a list of what do we want to shoot, coming up with that first, then coming into more details. And was this a scripted shoot? It was more of a, a detailed bullet points. Because we don't do scripted. No, we had, we, we had to make sure we hit certain facts and points that were very important to let the viewers know. And at the same time, you know, you put your own little twist on it. You know, we, we, we had to have we'd have fun while we discussed ISO or aperture or shutter speed or whatever we were talking about. Um, but we had a roadmap so we would never get lost. Look, I'm not telling you you've got to go to point A and point B and stay on the highway. You can take a country road to get there, but at least you know where you're going to hit country at the end of the road, day. Take me home. Exactly. To that place. Is that is that John Denver? That is John Denver. Oh God, not a good song when you got to fly. Oh, no, not at all. But but have a plan. That's huge. Yeah, that and, and that's huge. And because we had that, we were able to to fill our shoot days to utilize our crew to the maximum extent. Absolutely. Because we knew what we were going to shoot. And anything that we did during pre-production, we were able to do our research. We were able to sit there and say, you know what would be good if we did here? And then we came up with ideas while doing it, which made everything so much better. Absolutely. All right. But there is a whole section on pre-production. A whole thing. We go into detail about all that. Marcelo Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Wow. 
uh, this is another autofocus, uh, manual focus. This could be something that we've already talked about. But manual focusing when shooting a DSLR, it's an easy, what can be done to make it more accurate. Is there a technique or accessory to make it easier? I think we basically we hit that again it's aperture and follow focus right aperture follow focus there's a lot of different things we do talk about but we already talked about it earlier Mm -hmm. the one thing i just want to say is if you have a a, say a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens Mm -hmm. and you're trying to follow a subject at 1.8 it's going to be almost impossible to track that subject but if you go to say 5.6 or 6.3 then you're going to have an easier time because basically this is 1.8 mm-hmm This is 6.3. So you're going to be able to make sure that somebody's in focus, and so you don't have to focus pull as far each time that you're moving. It's almost impossible to do it at 1.4. Watch your favorite programs. I mean, watch watch what you see on television when you see big action scenes. They don't have shallow focus, but when somebody's sitting there and contemplating, then they've got that shallow depth of field. Watch TV shows, and you're going to see examples of when they use the shallow shallow focus and, and not. Or when we're doing an EPK and somebody's sitting in a chair, they're not, not moving. moving. Not moving. You, you, could, c- you could be 2.8 and be tack darn sharp. Absolutely. Because and they're and not we moving. did that. And we did that in that case. Nice. Uh, this is an interesting one, and I think I'm going to have to read into it a little bit. Keith Uyeta. What's the easiest way to get that jittery, jittering effect out when panning quickly over something? Any way to prevent it even at 24 frames a second, question mark? This is the jello effect when people move pan very quick. I two things. It was it's either that, the moray that you see when you when you turn too quick, or it's potentially a shutter speed issue. If they're seeing it when I hear jitter, jittery, I, I, I tend to think that word means maybe their shutter speed is too high. And that they're getting a jittery look to like it, like staccato. Exactly. So it, it, it could be either flowing. or. I mean, the DSLRs, um, you know, lesser in some of the newer ones uh, that have newer sensors, but there is that jello effect when when you pan too fast. That's just the nature of the beast. But I would I would you know, double check your shutter speed. Yep. Okay. Ent- entropy. And skateboarding. Entropy? Entropy? Well, Entropy Skate... Oh, it must be a business name. It's okay. not a person's name. Entropy Skateboarding. Hi, when shooting action, do you prefer using high shutter speeds or, unlike still photos, do you prefer shooting, let's say, around 250th or 300th of a second? Your other guides have helped me immensely. Thanks. And, by the way, I'm using a D7100 with a Nikon 10.5... Basically, basically the 2.8 fisheye. Um, so when you're shooting sports... There's, there's a ton of different options. You can shoot at, well, for shooting at 60 frames a second, generally speaking, you're going to want to be at 120th of a second. I think it's 125th. 125th? That's the option you have. Well, That's the option we had in that camera. But he was saying he was shooting at 300, 250, unless he's looking for a stylistic shot, which he may, if, if, if it's skateboarding, he may want that stylistic look, and it might look a little choppy, a little bit um, Saving Private Ryan, Storming the Beach, that kind of a look might be fine. But for that cinematic look that you might, they might want, it should be double your frame rate. Uh, that could be. No it definitives. Should it should be. Well, in theory. If you're looking for that look. Depending on what you're that looking look. for. But if, if, if you want that stylistic look, then you go to those higher frame rates or slower. If you want, if it, it, it affects your motion blur, basically, is See, what's this, happening. This is the stuff that we would be on set. And so there's different rules of, uh, of thought. Like I come yeah. from a photo background. Todd comes from a video. Like sometimes if you want to shoot at a faster <laughs> shutter speed, like 400th of a second, there's things that you have to you have to figure out. Like if you're going to shoot at 400th of a second, that could change. That's you're letting you're cutting back on light you're doing different things you have to bump your iso that part of the exposure triangle still comes into play but like todd said if it's a stylistic thing then you can go with that generally speaking you're not going to shoot at those faster uh shutter speeds because it 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 has you can see it with the uh the metronome going back and forth now don't get me wrong you can play around with those higher shutter speeds stylistically because we did that when we shot the music video we played around with a higher shutter speed because we wanted a unique look. But if if uh, if you think something doesn't look right because with your videos, check your shutter speed. Try it at that that double your frame rate and see how that looks, and that might remedy the you know the issues that you think you have. Double your frame rate, double, double your, your fun. fun. 
Jason Ward, what are the what are the benefits to a photographer learning how to shoot video? What main tips will cross over to both taking pictures and shooting videos? Obviously, I'll I'll take this one, being that I'm a photographer. You are first. Um, here's some benefits. It's if you. We'll look at it in the business aspect of it and in a hobbyist personal aspect of it. Let's go with the personal side of it. If you have kids that play soccer or kids that play sports or kids that do stage shows, you know, still images are fantastic. But when you want to show the emotion going on in, in uh, well, motion, you want to be able to go ahead and shoot video. So if you're shooting the rehearsal or something, the dance recital, and you know how to do that, and the other people are sitting there with their iPhones and shooting it vertically, so you have vertical video, and you're sitting there with your DSLR, which you already own, yeah. or your mirrorless camera or any device like that, but you already own it, you have an understanding of how to get better better video you want to capture them spinning around as they're dancing doing ballet you know that you're going to want to get you're going to go to 60 frames a second because you may want to slow that down later so it's just giving you another tool in your belt or another feather in your cap so that you're prepared for whatever situation may may present itself because these cameras all have the ability to shoot video these days why not learn how to do it on the business side, if you are a professional photographer, I have talked to so many professional photographers, and we're talking guys that can that get paid fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars a photo shoot or more, and they don't know what they're doing with video, but they keep saying, they keep asking me, can I do behind the scenes video while I'm on the set? Can I do? More? That is an opportunity for them on the business side to make more money mm -hmm. for their job because they could learn. And honestly, I will be giving or selling this guide to those people that have a hundred, make a hundred thousand dollars on shoots because this is designed for them as well. It's definitely another source of revenue. And I think I'm not done, Todd, Damn it. but go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, all I was going to say is, is if you are a working photographer, you probably already have a decent eye, a good eye about getting a good shot. Composition, good, good composition, framing. Good framing. That's, that's half the battle, just being able to know what looks good through that lens. So I, I, think, I think that's – if you've got that going for you – You're going to pick it up pretty quick. Get, getting all the fundamentals of the technical stuff and all that jazz – is going to be a breeze, and I think this is going to really just step your game up and open more sources of revenue for you. Right, and th like I said earlier, not everybody wants to make money with the video, but having the options and putting it up for the family and being the, the star of the family because you put up these videos. You know what? Let's play the theoretical game. Your kid's in high school. All right, let's call your daughter. She's number, uh, number seven on the soccer team, and she's really, really good. So she scores goals. She plays great defense. She 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 uh, she plays. She runs fast, and you create a reel, right? A reel that you then send to college to try to get her a scholarship, and then she gets a full ride to go play sports because you. That's right. You were able to go out there and shoot video of her. So that she could do that. Could you imagine people trying to send an iPad video and trying to put that together uh, to send in for their kid to get a scholarship? I mean, that's just a theoretical in my mind, but it's not that far off. It's absolutely not far it's, off. It's not far off. Mm -mm. The other thing, those business guys, those guys making $100,000, it's not just for them, but this guide would be great for them. Sure. And great for the people that just picked up their cameras. Yeah, man. That was a good question. Why did I like, should they spin the wheel of fro? No, because we're not spinning the wheel of fro this show, Steven. <laughs> uh, Ronnie Hoogland. Hoogland do the rules of composition apply to video in the same way as they do for photography or are they different uh, I, composition I think it's very similar very similar I mean the, the biggest difference is um, coverage not so, not so much composition but coverage because you're telling a story through sequential shots and I think that's 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 a, a thing that people need to wrap their brains around. The composition of the frame, having you know the rule of thirds and things of that nature to have an interesting shot, totally translate if you're a photographer that understands that stuff. Coverage and, and the 180 rule and things that we get into on uh -huh. that end, I think are are probably the part where you can build off of your strong composition. Let me explain coverage for a second. That's making sure that you have the shots that you need plus some. 
like your wides, your mediums, your close-ups. Exactly. All that so when we talk about composition, I still do video. You know, again, you're in the 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so you're different than what the frame is for a still image. I still try not to cut things off. I still try not to cut off the toes and cut off at the ankles. You'll see a lot of video guides, guys, not guides, but video people, to be politically correct, that cut off at the ankles. And I sit there and I watch and I go, well, that's horrible, the composition. That's my personal preference sure. I try to translate my photo angles over to this. But for example, if, if you have a full wide shot, you get the whole body in there. Then you come in tight and you do the waist up. And then you come in tight and you do the shoulders and mm -hmm. the head and shoulder mm -hmm. shot. And, and, and in terms of coverage, let's say that we're demonstrating popcorn popping. Mm -hmm. So we're making a video about popcorn popping. Here's what I'm seeing in my, in my mind, and this is part of the pre-production and making sure that you have everything that you need. You have, uh, you've got the material that you're going to use. Mm -hmm. You've got close-up shots of those. You've got wide shots of somebody pouring the popcorn. We're using my popcorn. Is the machine in the background of Todd's angle? It should be, right? Probably. The popcorn machine. So in essence, I'm going to go put some popcorn in it. So we want to get the person wide putting the popcorn in the machine. Yeah. Then we want to get a little tight of the popcorn falling out of the thing going into the oil. And then the oil and the stuff spinning. Tight shots of it popping. Audio of it popping. I mean, just all of these things, that's what you're thinking when you're doing these shoots. Whereas, you know, this this question came up. I mean, this came from a, a photography composition question whereas you may just take one shot of popcorn coming out of the of the popper and that would be your story here in video you've got to get great composition for multiple angles and multiple uh, wide mediums and close-ups to tell a story in post i agree todd Thank Javier you. Escalera Jr. yes video in low light question mark question mark same as photo question mark raise iso question mark what about shutter speed? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Can I record in aperture or shutter speed mode, or does it have to be all manual? Looking forward to this guide. Low light photo, low light video. All manual. Uh, ISO, yeah, ISO is going to be your friend. And, and again, we we talk about this about how um, how popular these these DSLR cameras are, and how how attractive they were to me early on as an independent filmmaker because you didn't need as many lights. To get the shot, um, obviously we've touched on shutter speed. Shutter speed is not your friend when it comes to uh, uh, just jumping, moving throwing it, up it and around, down. and just hap, hap I mean, that's not that's not going to you know if that shouldn't be your first option there for light. Um, and we also get into ISO. You know how high to take it. Just because you can boost it to the maximum doesn't mean that you should. I think that was when we were in the elevator. We, we were did in low the elevator. light in the elevator. Yep, yep. That was that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things where I got to read the question again because my brain is starting to be fried. Uh, yeah, video and low light, obviously the ISO is going to help. Sometimes opening up your aperture, but you have to remember, like with photo, it's same thing. You're letting more light in that way. You're bumping your ISO. You're letting more light in that way. You have to be concerned about your focus then, though. Right. If, if you've got a subject in low light that's moving around quickly, then you probably have to keep that aperture a little wider open. So you have to bump up that ISO and then... You can't really mess with your shutter speed because maybe you want it to be cinematic. So then what do you do? You bring in lights. If you can, you bring in some light. Hopefully you can bring in some lights, and then we get into lighting techniques in the guide. So, I mean, there are answers throughout this guide for multiple situations. Yeah, and I guess the, the, the thing is sometimes in low light, if it's really bad, it's just going to look like that. It's just going to look gonna like that. It's going to be a lot of great. Look, I have been on set 3 o'clock in the morning. We have to get this shot. The crew's looking at me like I'm crazy. We're not bringing, we're not running power out into this alleyway. We got to get the shot. We bumped that ISO through the roof. We got the shot. It was a little grainy. It was a little noisy, but we got the shot. Here's the thing with video. You can get away with a little more with video than with stills, in my opinion, uh, especially when it comes to, well, one ISO, but, but focus. I'm all about everything being tack, tack, sharp. Yeah. There's times in video that you're going to see there may be something that's slightly out, but then in the next split second, it's back in yes. because they got the focus. Sure. I think you have more leeway with, with your video when, when shooting video to, uh, to fudge that a little bit. You see that in feature films all the time where they're, I mean, subjects move, they pull focus, and, and they get it. And, and, you know, we touch on that. Terrence Moody, is there any way to bypass the video time limit for recording on a DSLR? It's a very good question. Can it I take is. it? Take it. So How about it? here's the thing. 
There are multiple, there's a couple of different answers. Let's first look at the reason why you can't shoot past on the on the Canon side. Won't continually record in the camera, Todd. I swear it does. Twenty nine fifty nine on the five D Mark III in the uh, highest resolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that the highest resolution? Yes, yeah. you get twenty nine fifty nine. That's twenty nine minutes and fifty nine seconds because it won't go over that thirty. From what we've been told, I think from asking people in the know, the the camera manufacturer, camera manufacturers, there's something about taxation mm-hmm. that importation, getting the stuff imported. There's some old old tax laws about cameras or some recording devices not being able to do twenty five uh, any more than thirty minutes. Yeah, that's what it is. The way around it. Is something like an Atomos. Yes. We use the Atomos on our cameras here uh, for when we do raw talk, and that can do continuous output as long as you have enough battery power and enough space mm-hmm. on either the cards or the hard drives that yep. you're doing. So in essence, what happens is the mirror stays flipped up the whole time, the live view stays on the whole time, and you're getting a clean feed and what they call HDMI feed out of your camera right to the Atomos, which is then giving you unlimited record, basically unlimited record time. We've taken it over two hours with plenty of room to spare. No, that's a great option for something like that. Thanks, Todd. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about the Atomos and just all these devices attached to it when you attach hard drives and all that stuff. The only thing is you get to certain points, and, and, and you know... Where you've got extra gear on your on your camera, and if you're running and gunning, it can be a little. Uh, eh. There's lots of questions here, so All right. we're still getting through. Right, uh, no, fine. I'm just talking about my. I need to. I need to keep my mouth sh- shut. Oh well, actually, what's good is that the same. The next two questions are the same exact question because I must have copied it twice and not deleted it. Oh, good. That's good. Nick, which should I read? Should I read the top one or the bottom one? <laughs> read half of the top one and half of the bottom one. Nicholas Ryan Watts. Ryan Watts. Ryan Watts. I have never shot video. I have been shooting a D3000 for six years now, and your guide has helped me out so much that with the release of this new guide, I have been considering upgrading to the D7100. I know it will help me in low-light photography aspect, but will it be easy to pick up video right from the start with this new guide? Simple answer. It's really simple. You've been shooting for six years with a DSLR. The, the answer is absolutely yes. Yes. You're going to be in a place. You're, I would consider you a hobbyist, you know? But I think he's the perfect person for this guy. I think that's a perfect video. person. He is the perfect person because he already knows the buttons, the way around his camera. He, he, he knows what has gotten him the best results on the photography side. And any kind of differentiations that happen on the video side, he's going, we're going to point them out to him. And then we're going to build on top of that. And I think he is the perfect candidate for this guide. Yep. You actually have a leg up for this already because you have an understanding. And that's the cool part about it. If you already have an understanding of the photo aspect, you're jumping right into this. And we're giving you what you need to know to get going. Carlo Cloribel, what is the best post-processing editing software for beginners or hobbyists? Hmm. Todd? I mean, I think a lot of people probably, uh, the first thing they, they get their hands on is probably iMovie. If they're on a Mac. Oh, if they're on a Mac. If uh, you're on a PC, you're kind of s- stuck. Well, Windows Movie Maker is not much of an option. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say a good option is probably, and this is still Mac related, is, is Final Cut X. Especially if, you, if you've never truly edited before. Um, usually people transitioning from other systems to X have a worse time with it. But I use both. I use X. I use Premiere. I've dabbled in Avid. I used to cut on 7, Final Cut 7, 6, 5, 4. So the next question goes along with this one, so I'll read it. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Mazuski, will the guide cover workflow and editing with Final Cut Pro X? Also, do you talk about using the different focus modes on the DSLR when shooting video? Let's take the first part of that. We didn't make this guide to be about editing. Uh, that is a separate thing that we will work on mm-hmm. that we will probably put out in the future, but we wanted to make sure that we got the fundamental aspects right. Just like what I did with the, the Fronos Photo Guide to Getting Out of Auto, I didn't get into how to edit your photos. I wanted you to get the tools down first, the fundamentals. There is a bonus section that Todd is creating or created. Mm-hmm. What is that section? It's, it's, it's editing tips, and I don't get into necessarily the button pushing is what I'm going to call it because all of these editing programs cut wipe dissolve they all do the same the theories thing. they all do the same thing I dive into tricks and tips that 
help to make a better looking video editing editing tips that i think uh are bigger than just what button to push to do this and what button to push to do that. The, the, you can find them online all day long, and that's not hard. I think where people really get stuck is when um, they cut robotically. And I think I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you some real genuine insight, some things that I truly believe help to make, help you tell the most powerful story through editing. Because editing, to me, is the end-all, be-all if you're a filmmaker, that is the ultimate. You are God at that point. If you're a good editor. I am God. Todd is a point. very, very good editor. And I love sending him my work to come up with stuff. He's not actually God. but Not really. But that that's a great question. And that that is a bonus section that Todd has created. So that's on top of everything. That's a bonus There's piece. a lot of good stuff in that. I, I will say there's there is so many good things in that that I think you'll we be able to... We should charge for it? You'll be able to easily consume what I'm giving you and put it into practice immediately. Well, see, that's, that's what I like about your mentality of teaching it. Because when I asked you about making a, a guide to editing, yeah. which will go hand in hand with this in the future, yep. you're like... I don't want to make another guide that just teaches you how to use a program. Mm -mm. And if you, again, understand the theories, reasons, and fundamentals that, of why you would make cuts or how you will do this, you're going to really do much better. You're going to be able to use any program that's out yes. there. The things that I would want to dive into would work and make you a great editor in any past program or any any editing program that's coming out in the future. It, the mentality is the same. Just like with the cameras... Good fundamentals will translate no matter what camera comes out in the future. Jackie Burhans or Burhan, Burhans. Bur Burhans. I have an Icon D7000 with a Rode video mic. When I record, mm. I get a lot of humming noises on the audio track. Hmm. I can clean the audio to some extent with Adobe Premiere and Audition, but how do I record without it? I think I know what their issue is. Okay. I think their issue is that their levels are too high when they're recording, which is causing the hiss. It's the issue I had when I first started. But it was a humming, so that's that's low end. Um, it could be that. Double check your levels, and we definitely get into how to set your levels in the guide. I would also look to possible mechanical things in-house. Is your air conditioning on? Is Do you have a refrigerator humming in ah, the background? Ah, refrigerator. I mean, there are those things... That's a good. I I have a I have that mic. Can I give and that quick tip though? What I have. Let, let me finish. <laughs> I have I have that mic. It's a good mic. Um, but if you any, it's gonna pick up any of that stuff. If you've got uh um, like I said, any, any kind that's any. It sounds to me like it maybe just something throwing out some low end air conditioner. Uh uh, maybe a computer that's nearby. Or on the flip side, they could mean that maybe there's the hissing. If Which it, is yeah. what I ended up getting with my videos yep. because I didn't know I was – like levels. Like you yep. raise them up, mm -hmm. you're going to hear an audible something like yeah. that yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's just it, – the levels are so high. It's peaking. It's picking up things. We have the whole section on audio. Yep. I want to just give that quick tip or whatever. We, well, we talked about – because we had to deal with it at the bar. Yeah. yeah. So we were at it the – It happens a lot. Anytime you're in a, in a bar or restaurant – Sound guys are always like, are there refrigerators? Right. So we were at the bar and we're like, oh, man, there's a bunch of refrigerators here. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't pull it because it's a bar and they had stuff in it. Yeah. But one of the tips that we, we would give so that you, you would pull the power. And what happens if you go home and you forget to, to plug it back in and they lost all the stuff that was in there? Mm -hmm. We came up with the simple quick tip or the solution is put your keys inside the refrigerator because you're not going to be able to leave without your keys so you're going to go looking for them hopefully you find them then you plug the refrigerator back in yep. and then you won't forget it yep. and yep. that was a pretty good tip but to answer her question quickly check your levels check the environment andrew Picarillo. 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 what is the basic gear someone would need to start shooting video beyond a camera and a lens that's a good question. I would say a microphone and some lights. Microphone, some lights. Even if you don't have lights, you have daylight you can shoot in. Sure. Uh, I think this, what did I have? I had something in here in the outline. We have basic stuff we talk about, like the cameras, batteries, cards. Just basic stuff that you may need. So if you have the camera, you have the lens, you said audio, 
a memory card. Yeah, it, I mean, it sounds to me when I when I hear basic, I think you got the lens, you got the camera, you got the oh. battery, you got the cards. Maybe a tripod with a follow a tripod with a uh, at least a tripod, at least some stability. It doesn't have to be have to be the beefiest tripod. So something to give you some stability. Get that camera out of your hands. Definitely a microphone. Audio goes a long way. And then if you can get some get some lights. I mean, I, I've seen guys get lights from Home Depot, construction lights, to throw a little bit of light on their scene. Nothing wrong with that, as long as you uh, you color balance correctly. Tudor Stuparuru. You are murdering people's names. No, it's Stuparu. S-T-U-P-A-R-I-U. We need the guide to pronunciation. Tutors to be the blood. All right, thanks, Todd. I know how to do this. I know how to do the slider movements, pannings, and all these things. My question is, how do you know when to use them? For example, how can you know a pan would be better than a slide for a certain scene? And I am throwing that to Todd because he's the master of the slide and this thing. Pans I would use to follow. I mean, to me, if if you can use a slide anytime. I'd I'd always go with the slide because the production value is much better there. You really, <laughs> everybody's got a tripod for the most part. That separates the men from the boys or for the girls from the women. When you can do a slide, any kind of movement, any kind of movement that's 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 a, con- a controlled movement. And look, you can buy a slider like Todd like shows you. We have a whole section showing you different sliders. Yeah. you can even take one of those video monopods and. Pan it down and lift it up gently. Mm -hmm. Those are ways to create motion. But the reason I was laughing at Todd is because when I was previewing one of the sections uh, of the, the, the scene in the bar where Todd did a slider... Oh yeah. Of the glasses cuz it's a great it's a great it's a the great slide. element stuff. Right. Yeah. The problem mm-hmm. was that Todd used it almost 3 times in a row and I was like Todd that's one too many slides in the final uh, edit. I I, I kind of <laughs> knew it was but I was like here look at this shut up. No. <laughs> oh, and then, and then I was like I showed it to Steven and he's like yeah, that's it. you can't have a slide right after a slide unless it's coming back the other way. <laughs> it's it's uh <laughs> that that type of movement I always love utilizing as bookends. Which well, is a, a open open your scene with like a nice uh, moving shot because sometimes those can be a little uh, um, uh, constraining in terms of uh, they take a little bit of manpower set up. You got to pay attention to the slider, the jibs, whatever you're using. So I like to use them in an opening shot, and maybe a, a, a closing shot. Um, and then you can go in and pick off your 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 coverage with uh, you know just your tripod and whatnot. Right, and, and and these sliders at times, like if you're shooting an inanimate object, it's going to be cool to slide around it or to give it motion or to come up into it out of frame. I'd always pick motion over over a pan or a tilt every, well, every day of the week. You definitely do. I know you love every doing that. And if you have the time, it's definitely something mm-hmm. to pick up that is good. Yep. Uh, Junior Wyatt wanting to shoot music videos, cine lenses versus prime lenses versus zoom lenses. What would you recommend? Pros and cons of each would be question mark. Personal preference, Todd. Uh, I mean, if he's if he's renting or purchasing cine lenses, he may be beyond this this guide at this point. But I um I have a heavy preference, especially as a one man band, which is what we focus on here. As a one-man band, I really lean towards zoom lenses so that I can get one shot and I can quickly get another shot, especially if it's if it's fixed at 2.8 or whatever the case may be. I love being able to just gun and get the shot, get my wide, get my close-up, get my medium, all in, 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 in the range of a lens. Let me give you a, 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 a prime example of a zoom. No pun intended. That was good, right? That was good. Was no right. prime, prime yeah. example. Yeah. So you have a Sigma 17 to 50 2.8. Pretty good lens for 500, 600 bucks. Not a lot of money. What's the range? Well, it's at 17 to 50, 2.8. 70 to 50, yeah, yeah, On a yeah. DX. Yeah, not good. full frame, but on a, on a crop sensor camera. It's a nice it's, little wide lens. It's yeah. a great lens yeah. for, say, say you want to get a wide of an interview. that esta- It's an establishing shot of the guy really sitting wide. in a chair. Yeah. Right, it's giving you a wide shot. But, well, 17 is more like a... Uh, like a 30 millimeter lens. Oh, yeah, right. You got to right, add your right. crop yep, factor yeah, your crop, depending crop on. Sensor. My bad. 17 is a 20. And we talk all about that. Well, yeah, we do. 17 on a Nikon is a 25 and a half. Yep. On a Canon, it's more like a 27 because it's 1.6 versus 1.5. We talk about all that. We so go into that. Like, you're almost like 25 to like a 70, 75, right around there. Uh, when, when to 80, the basically. Yeah, yeah. But look, you've got that lens. You start with a wide shot. Now you want to do a slightly tighter. You zoom in, you move. What's going to happen is if you use all prime lenses, which prime lenses are beautiful. Absolutely. But if you have just a 50 millimeter prime, you're going to back yourself all the way up. Your lavalier that's 30 bucks may not 
run far enough to plug into the, the camera. And now you're going to have to start getting into wireless audio, which means you're spending more money and you have to do some extra work after the fact. So, you know, having the right lens selection is important. Yeah. Primes are beautiful for certain things. And zooms definitely keep you moving quicker. In a one-man band situation, I think zooms are... I highly recommend the zooms. Once you grow and you've got yourself an, an assistant camera person and somebody that can feed you lenses and you've got a crew that can move other things when you're not responsible for everything, go for primes. They can be a little sharper, but one-man band... Zoom, zoom, zoom. All right, so the next ones we've kind of answered, but we're going to move through quicker. Dale Nevin, do you cover how to record sound? Absolutely. And the best way to do it... See, I, I read Dale's question because he asks a lot of questions. Good. So he's been around a while, okay. so I threw it in here, threw him a bone. Like um, but also, when I was picking questions, I was just filling them up, and some didn't realize we had the same ones in there. Always shoot stills, but never have done a, uh, never have done a video. So Dale Nevin, do you cover how to record video? And the best way to do it... I always shoot stills, but never done video. Thanks. Yeah, Dale, you will understand how to get audio from watching this guide. Once you watch those audio sections, you're going to understand it. Yeah. The rule, the, the keys here are to go out and practice it and don't wait till you're on a photo shoot to practice it. Yeah, we N dive deep into that. Jasper Van Burkle. To preview or not to preview, I'm going to get this as soon as... As soon as it's out, since the former Fro Guides rock, and really want to get, uh, really want to get better at DSLR video. I'm having trouble getting tack sharp manual focus. I kind of read that because he he liked the first guides, and I wanted to pat myself on the back well, and you. to pat yourself on the back. We talked about tack sharp focus in this heavily, so I can move on mm -hmm. from that. Again, I have the same question twice here. What is wrong with Double me? Double the fun. Annette Matthews, I am fairly new to shooting DSLR. I assist a photographer in town uh, on small projects, but I don't feel that I'm getting as much knowledge and hands-on as I want. My question, do you, uh, my question to you regarding this guide, will you have a section or sections where you will give the student the opportunity to complete assignments to practice the lessons taught? So let me just tell you, Annette asked this question. And I then promptly sent her a message as saying this was one of the best questions that somebody could ask. Sent her a preview of the guide because I wanted nice. to, because she asked such a good question. Nice. I wanted to get the preview because we then went ahead and made uh, assignments for this guide. Yep. Because it's really important, and I think uh, what what you're going to see in the in the bonus because this is a bonus mm -hmm. thing for assignments. Yep. We're going to give you a thing that breaks down assignments that you can do on your own and. To basically go out there and shoot to to try. So their assignments, we're not gonna we're not gonna have you turn them in as homework. They're just things that you can go out and do. So we're gonna give you tip, uh, ideas on what you can shoot, which is always what sometimes people have trouble doing. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think going out and practicing these things and these structured assignments are gonna be a great way to iron out all the kinks before you've got a paying customer sitting there staring you down. Very good, Todd. Thank you. I'm gonna keep moving. Yvonne King. I shoot with a 7D and a 5D Mark III and have mm. seen a number of videos, etc., including some excellent ones on Creative Live, but I still do not know how to nail the focus. Oh, no one. We have a lot of focus questions <laughs> yeah. here. No one ever covers it, so it must be really simple, but I'm just not getting it. For example, is the white box, sorry, is the white box not the focus? When you move it around, nothing really happens. You can advance it if you don't get the basics. So... I understand the question. Okay. I understand the question here. And no, focus isn't that simple that they should not just teach it to you. Everybody should have a focus on focus. You like that, Todd? Look at you. I see what you did there. You the see what I did? On the focus. focus on the <laughs> right. So focus is really important. When you're moving the white box around, so somebody asked this earlier. I guess we didn't answer it. But different focusing modes. You've got your continuous focus. You have your single focus. You have your manual focus. When it comes to moving subjects, we are using the manual focus. If you're in manual, the white box or whatever that's showing up, a white box would probably be a Canon camera. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the you know, the box isn't going to do anything. That, that, that's just your when you zoom. That, that's the box you utilize to zoom in. Well, that's a box you utilize to zoom yeah. in, but it's also the box that has your focus points, whether it's tight, wide, or, or larger. Um, here's a point where I do sometimes use auto. 
if I am, say, when I'm setting up my YouTube video and I put the mannequin in the chair and I pre-focus, because I have trouble with manual, mm -hmm. I will go into single focus, make sure my focus point is where I want it, press the, the focus button to allow it to lock in like I'm shooting a photo and I have yep. the beep go off. Yep. I hear the beep. I then switch my camera into manual focus. So now it's locked. And as long as that doesn't move and the subject doesn't move, I just used auto to lock myself in. So that's how you make sure you get tack sharp right there. But if your subject moves or you move, that's where your focus is going to be off. Yep. I know, the focus on focus. Um, so that answers that. Alex Menzi, for a complete beginner in video, what kind of rig or stabilizer would you invest in that offers the most versatility to shoot basic events like family reunion or art exhibitions? At those events, I would most likely be mobile, so a tripod is a no-go. Thanks, guys. I would probably say a shoulder mount. Um, you could also use like a stabilizer, like a glide cam of some sort. But those, I think unless you have a vest steady cam rig, those would be a little tiresome. I think a shoulder rig is probably what you're looking for with maybe a follow focus and things like that. Shoulder rig is a basic one that you could do. Mm -hmm. You could also get one of those uh, Ben Rowe or Manfrotto video monopods. They have the feet yes. on the bottom. Yes. We show you that. We I think we show five, six, seven different options yep. of, of stabilizers that you can use that range from inexpensive to really... Re I think the crane... Sorry, the jib that was shooting us is a really expensive jib. Yeah. Jibs are for movement, but that was just to shoot us to make sure the video was done right. Um, but rigs offer you something, and this video monopod offers you something. There's pros and cons to both, and we kind of go over that yeah. inside. Yeah. Uh, Nicole Yankovich. 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 Yeah, Yankovich. Wow. One thing I love about my camera, Nikon D3200, when shooting photos is the viewfinder. When I shoot video, however, the viewfinder no longer works and I'm forced to use the screen. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to use the viewfinder with video? If not, do you have any tips for how to use the image on the viewfinder in bright sun? I know what she's asking. Mm -hmm. So basically, she's saying she likes using the viewfinder for shooting stills, which is absolutely what you should do. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're shooting video, the mirror flips up and blocks your viewfinder. At, le at least that's on a DSLR. If you're sure. using a mirrorless camera, it doesn't have a mirror to block anything. So what you see is what you're getting here. So you're using the live view. So yes, you may have trouble to see that in bright sunlight, but there's options like a loop yep. or you have... Um, you could do a external monitor mm -hmm. with a shade on it. Mm -hmm. So there are options to do it. You wouldn't want to shoot video looking through a viewfinder. Uh, like, well, actually, you don't want to shoot through that little viewfinder. It's not going to let you. But we use things like a, a loop. There's a Hoodman one that's inexpensive, and then there's a more expensive one called a Zacuto yep. that allow you to basically... It magnifies that screen for you, allows you to put your eye right in it. That is such a beautiful way to shoot. Yep. Anything to add to that? No, you nailed that. I did. I nailed it. I nailed it good. Mm -hmm. Danny Webster. What can you do if your camera doesn't have an external mic jack? Can you only use the internal microphone? You would use it as a reference, but then you would use an external recording source. You would, uh, uh, I think we showed the uh, the Zoom, and there's a couple other, there's a bunch of external type of recorders you could use. And, and at that point, we get into how you would go about using the external recorder, and then syncing that later and what you, the steps you need to do while you're in production to make sure you can sync up that sound later. But you can totally get better sound if you do not have a mic jack. You can record, use the mic that's in your camera as a reference, get yourself an external microphone source, a recording device, and clappy clap, or get a clapboard, and, and you're good to go. Yeah, so definitely the, the clap, we talk about the clap. <laughs> Not that clap. Yeah. The clapping thing. Clapping um, clap. So if you have these options, like a D3200 or Nikon D3300, a lot of them don't have the audio inputs, but you're seeing more cameras have them. Sure. But we do a lot of external recording. We're actually recording this externally from the from the video cameras. Yeah. We're using a Zoom H6. Zoom makes a an H1, which is like 99 bucks, that mm -hmm. can sit on the top of your camera and act as an external microphone or you could plug in you could plug the lavalier mic that you talked about yep. right into there yep. you would clap you would have both audio forms and this is this gets into the editing aspect but you look for the spike or you use something like pluralize or on the on the mac end of it it's automatically going to do the the lining up for you yep. um 
and it lines up the audio. You get rid of the bad audio, yep. and you're good to go. So those are the things that you can do uh, if you can't do audio in the camera. Yep, absolutely. Cool? Yep, perfect. All right, this is the last question I have. Oh, no. Chaim, oh, that's right, A- C-H-A-Y-I-M. Chaim A. Ushers. Oh, his last name's Usher. <laughs> I thought it was Chaim Usher. Chaim A. Usher. Usher. Does the same rule of better glass work when shooting with cine lenses? And did you or can you do some comparisons to inexpensive cine lenses to the big boys? Um, we I, I, did we use any cine lenses on this shoot? Mm-mm. We didn't. Use, we didn't break out any of those. We used all the lenses we had in our bags that we used for shooting stills. Yep. And I know I can go all the way back to the beginner guide that Todd shot the very first beginner guide and he broke out an 18 to 135 kit lens and I yelled at him for doing that but that was what he needed to shoot me run and gunning in the park uh, photographing the kid whose name was X-Men Yes. What's his Wolverine. name? Wolverine. No, Logan. Wasn't, well, Logan. Way to get to that. We mm. got to X Men to Wolverine to Logan. We got there. That's how we got, we there. got there. So Todd was following me around with that. And the only thing you may lose there is the depth of field. But then again, because we're moving and Todd needed to get better focus, he was at 5.6 or 6.3 already. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you may see some sharpness differences here and there. Sure. Cine lenses are beautiful, they're more expensive, but. I don't even remember the question because we've done a lot. Yeah, better glass can be is great when you're sitting. Better glass is better glass Look, is better glass. A fifty-one-two for Canon, an eighty-five-one-two, and you have somebody that's doing an interview. They're gonna look beautiful, gonna look gorgeous. You get a fifty-millimeter one-point-four or fifty-one-point-eight. They're gonna look. They're gonna gorgeous. look gorgeous. Yes, you're not gonna see a lot of a difference. So again, fundamentals. It all comes down to fundamentals and giving. We are giving you the right tools to get the job done for video. I mean, we, we've answered a lot of questions here. We've told a lot of great information, I think. I think so, too. You know, so if you want to pick up the guide, click up on the screen. It helps us continue to make the other free videos. But look, for the sale price that this thing is at, you, you're going to be hard pressed to find that information out there free that's going to be in a in easily found Agreed. you know people are selling things that are a lot more expensive than what we're doing i wanted to hit a target price that was good i think for everybody because i think it's amazing i if, think it's a steal I, I think it's a steal also if you're looking to make money you will make more money shooting video than shooting photos agree at times Agreed. because or you're adding what are you looking at me weird no you steven was looking at me but not weird he that's says normal look look the thing is if you're a photographer going into video and you're, like I said earlier, you have a great leg up to shoot video and this guide is going to get you on the right track, whether you're a pro, a hobbyist, an amateur, a beginner, somebody who hasn't touched the camera before. Um, or or if you are a, a, a uh, burgeoning filmmaker. Like I know a lot of kids that will come to me and they're like, I really want to make movies. I want to get a T2I. I want to get this, but I can't get this. I can't get that. And they've got all the questions that we've answered right here. I think this is the, the perfect companion for that new filmmaker, that young filmmaker that's got the new DSLR that's really just trying to figure this out and put all the pieces together. This is a perfect companion. I'm going to make sure I get this for my cousin who who has a, uh, a 60D now, I think. I think I pushed him in that direction. And he's always got these little questions about why his videos don't look proper. Why? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? This is for him. Yeah. This is perfectly for him. And, and, and I, I'm so excited to see. I can't wait for the day when we get emails or links to videos, to videos that people have made utilizing these tools, and they look stunning. And I'm going to be worried about my job. Well, that's that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, when you when you give as much information as we do give, this guide is twice as long as the other guides that I've created. It's epic. I mean, we've got two hours of educational where we dive deep into all the, the specifics, the fundamentals, and then we've got four video shoots that we take you on. Each one of those is about an hour long. We do a music video. We oh, do the Fronos photo, my I Shoot Raw song. Yeah, we do We do your music video. Oh, boy. We do a short film. So we do a narrative short film, you know, movie type shot. We do an EPK, an electronic press kit, which is your corporate, your commercial kind of job, which 
would be great to make money out there. For example, if you are shooting realtors or you work with realtors, Perfect. Um, this is a Perfect. This, this is a great one. You shoot houses. Well, now you can go to the realtor and say, you know what? I think you should put these houses on YouTube. Let's make a freaking video where you walk through the house or you tell us about the house. So now you're adding that. You so you made X amount of dollars to shoot the house. You're now going to make X amount of dollars more because you just added something that they didn't know they need but could help them in their business sell and make more money, which makes you yeah. look better. I mean, that that's just that is one of those situations where Yes, you're a photographer, but everybody asks today if you also do video. I get asked now, and what do I say? Yes, You've absolutely. Got, you have an amazing tool in your hand with that DSLR camera, and the potential that it has to make you money and to allow you to be creative on both ends of it. Trust me, I'm a video film guy. Well, I watched what you filmed of, uh, for your daughter's birthday. Uh, well, yeah. The I, Harry Potter-themed birthday. I did that, but... Hopefully, maybe you've seen pictures. I've I've taken photos after doing your other guides because I learned a thing or two. <laughs> that was funny. And I I, I take better pictures. It, it it it's it's a two way street. You've got an amazing piece of equipment, a device that can help to tell stories that you've got in your brain. Regardless, as a photographer, you're a storyteller, one frame at a time. You can expand on that storytelling with multiple frames. Hopefully, twenty four frames because that's what I like. But you can do multiple frames and tell amazing stories. I, I'm counting the days until we get an amazing video and, and you decide to hire them instead of me. Oh, really? <laughs> All right. So we, we covered a ton. I think we delivered a lot of great information here. You uh, got to see some looks inside the video guide. If you want to take a deeper look inside of that, you can click the link uh, if we're on YouTube down below. That's going to take you over to the page where you can purchase it. You can also see a longer preview of stuff inside the guide. It's like a trailer to show you what you could be getting if you decide you want to pick it up. Uh, we definitely think it's, I think it's priced at the best place it could be. It could have been twice as much if not double uh, that is twice as much <laughs> double is twice as much jared uh it could have been three four times as much because the information in it is is like what you're going to find in a school it's just we did it from experience we made the guide based off of what would we have liked to have had if when, when we were learning this stuff so we took the mistakes that we made i know i made the mistakes when i started shooting getting all those things wrong that i talked about getting the i didn't understand frame rate i didn't understand why my shutter speed should have been here i didn't understand that if i did slow motion because i tried it and i was shooting at 24 frames a second why that was bad why my audio was bad now that we add movement into videos i didn't know why i did that just all these things i did wrong just saving you guys time and giving you the right foot forward to be successful with your DSLR for video. Uh, I totally went into this. When you pitched this to me, I absolutely went into this making the video I wish I had. The resource I wish I would have had to easily go and get the questions answered that I had. I may have understood this aspect, but I could not for the life of me figure out this over here. It's all in one place. And just doing this guide was a great refresher for me. Because there are some things that you start to do just on auto mode, basically. And you're like, oh, yeah, that is why we do that. And I do need to pay more attention to that. And I walked away from this guide with a renewed respect for everything that's there and everything you can pull off in, in these in these DSLR cameras, or any camera for that matter. Let's wrap it up, Todd. Rappy, rappy. That was good. Thank you. That was a one. The guide was a, a ton of fun to make. Oh, it was a blast. Two, it's going to help a ton of people. I can't wait, man. And, that, and, that's, and that's where we're at. So uh, I can't wait to give it as gifts to Friends that I know, or no, make them buy it. No, you got to buy it. Scrooge, Steven, you got to buy it. Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, everybody's got to, you got anyway. So if you found some uh, value in anything that, that I've delivered you over the last four years uh, uh, in those free videos, and you think that this is going to help you out, please support it. Pick it up. We put a lot of work into it. Yes. It's not only, you know, it's going to help you out, but it helps us continue on creating and bringing more of the free stuff. And if you just like the free stuff, this was a two hour, hour and a half. I don't even know how long this was of free stuff. Yeah, Enjoy it. Absolutely. But if you, if you think you can learn from it and you, uh, or know other people that can learn from it, shoot them over to it. And that is where we're going to end it. That's it guys. Check out the links below if you want to pick it up. And that my friends, is what they say in the movie business is that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya. <laughs>